Good morning, everybody. Today, we have two of them. Well, there will be, uh, but first, we have to finish talking about one of them. Over a year ago, I made a video called Beginning the EduQuest about this computer, the titular EduQuest. I said I'd make another, but I didn't, and I'm here to talk about why and what I did about it. The EduQuest is an IBM PC from 1993 and a form factor sometimes called all-in-one because the parts are all, you know, in one. Specifically, the monitor, um, all the other parts are pretty much in every PC. And let me tell you, that makes it really hard to capture clean footage. The monitor on this thing is like a mirror. It was reflecting my entire studio, and I didn't realize till after the shoot how distracting it was. I went through and hand blurred every single shot of this machine, so if the monitor looks weird and unsettling at times, that's why. Also, yes, I know about the haircut. Now, I've always been fascinated by all-in-ones, but I've also known that they all suck, most of them anyway. It was never all that popular a form factor for PCs, it's more of a Mac thing. So while I've always wanted to collect these, most of them aren't really worth collecting. Uh, for instance, I got this Compaq CDS524 a couple years ago, and you've never seen it in a video, because it's just not worth a video. It works fine, it has a 486 DX2 CPU, it runs Windows 95, it has sound, it runs games, and I just don't like it very much. It's ugly, it's boring, it's 90s bland, it's poorly built, it has a terrible monitor, it sucks to work on, and the whole machine just reeks of cheap design. But that's par for the course for all-in-ones. It doesn't get much better than that. I have no idea why I'm intrigued by these things. I guess I just like their appliance-like nature, but they're an objectively bad concept. Building the monitor into the machine doesn't get you anything other than a less convenient PC that's harder to fix and weighs more. But we all have our fixations and this is mine. I do still have some amount of taste though, and for the longest time, the only all-in-one I knew of that wasn't embarrassing to be seen with was the truly antique PS2 Model 25. For years, the Model 25 was a beige whale of mine. That's what I call something that I hope I'll stumble across someday, but I won't put in any effort to get. Here's a picture of one, and it might have you thinking that I finally got my whale, but this isn't that, fortunately. See, the Model 25 sucks, as far as I can tell. I've never had one, but it's one of the earliest entries in IBM's PS2 series, which were supposed to put them back on top of the PC market way back in 1987. I've always thought they looked super cool, but as usual for all-in-ones, they're just crappy low-end computers, really. Most that were ever sold had the same 4.7 megahertz clock speed as the original IBM PC from six years earlier in 1981. They did use a higher-end chip, the 8086, instead of the PC's 8088, but I already have my share of old, slow PCs. There'd have to be something else to sell me on this, and they're just really isn't. Um, the Model 25 doesn't have the best hardware to begin with, it doesn't have a lot of expansion options, and the video hardware leaves a lot to be desired. Uh, a lot of them were actually black and white only in 1987, if you can believe that. They did make color models, um, they made some with 286 CPUs and even a few with 386s, but both are fantastically rare and cost thousands when they show up. Even the original 8086s are pretty rare, uh, but even if I could get a hold of one of those at a price I liked, they're just not all that useful. They look cool enough, but they were cheap and outdated when they were new and they've only gotten worse. So I was never that fired up about them, but you know, I'd take one if it was offered, and if one of the 386 models ever showed up on eBay for like five or 600 bucks, I would have snapped it up, so I kept an eye on things. Periodically, one of the low-end color models would show up, and I'd think about buying it, and one time, one of the 386s showed up broken, and I put a huge bid down on it, but fortunately, I lost, because otherwise, I might not have gone looking for an EduQuest once I learned what they were. The EduQuest is much newer than the Model 25 by about six years. So while they may look similar, it's a totally unrelated, much better design. To be clear, um, this machine is like 20% bigger than that one. See, the Model 25 only has two three and a half inch bays on the front, while this machine has room for a whole five and a quarter, plus a couple three and a halfs and room to spare. So it's a big boy. Uh, that also means the display is much larger and 
all the hardware inside is of course completely different. As far as I know, there's no relationship between these machines other than the basic aesthetics, which I feel were clearly borrowed, uh, but I'm not sure if it's just because the same designers worked on both machines or if it was just a convenient place to start with this new model series. And the EduQuests were a series. This is not the only one. Uh, the models 30, 40, and 50 uh, were the original lineup sold in 1993. I believe a model 35 was added a bit later and the 45 and 55 came out in 1995, which as far as I can tell was the last year these were sold. This one is the EduQuest 30, the earliest, lowest end model, and the sticker on the back confirms it was made in 1993. All in ones generally suck, but this one scores way above all the other ones I'm aware of in many areas, and it's an intrinsically interesting specimen to boot. It's not only an all in one, which are relatively rare in the PC market, but one made by IBM themselves. They'd fallen pretty far from grace even by 93, but it's still intriguing to see a unique design exit the halls of the ancient bureaucracy. For context, uh, about a year later, IBM would start selling the Aptiva series, the blandest, dullest, most 90s ass computers you've seen in your life, and they would continue to sell those for like a decade. So this machine narrowly avoided a fate worse than death. It still actually looks like something. So. I was excited to get one for many reasons that I'll go over and I made a video about it pretty much the moment it arrived where I spoke about the very basics of it and then promised to go into more detail later and then I never did. Because unfortunately, the EduQuest 30 was a disappointment. It didn't end up being what I'd hoped. But fortunately, I have a new favored son. This identical looking box is an EduQuest 40, the mid-range option uh, from the original lineup, and it's a significant step up in hardware specs. They may look similar, but these are totally different generations. One has a 386 processor and the other is a 486. This is actually really neat because despite being super different, they both had to be packed into the exact same form factor. And you'll see what that looks like later in this video. But first, the question, why did I buy a second EduQuest when I hadn't even finished showing off the first one? Well, we gotta put this on the table. It's hard to talk about PCs because they're all the same. They run DOS. You can type dir, right? How many machines uh, do I own that can do that? It's like 30 right now, and in my lifetime it's been 500. They're all the same. It's really tough to make a video about a PC at least for me. Even for a machine that has a bunch of interesting qualities, it's still ultimately just DOS and you type dir. But in this case, there were further problems. Uh, for one thing, it turned out I'd been a bit presumptuous about what I could find on eBay for the 30. It was missing some parts uh, and I assumed I could just get those, but I set some saved searches and then a year passed and I didn't see anything. Not a single spare part ever popped up. Whoops. This kind of gets us into the question of what exactly these machines were. And I can't fully answer that because there's very little info in the fossil record. I get almost all the info from my channel from like consumer electronics magazines, InfoWorld, PC Magazine, that sort of thing. And they don't have anything about these, presumably because they weren't consumer machines. See, what I can tell you for sure is that the EduQuest PC was a product of EduQuest the company, a subsidiary of IBM. They used to be IBM Educational Systems from 1985 up until 1992 when IBM did a big internal reorganization and renamed them to EduQuest. My impression is that these machines were designed to target the needs of school computer labs in much the same way that Apple was doing with various Macs at the same time. So they were probably sold almost entirely through cold calls to school administrators. I don't think many individuals ever bought these. They were mostly just packed into computer labs, kept way past their prime, and then thrown out as scrap, except for the occasional unit that went home with a teacher, which is, I'm guessing, how virtually every one of these made its way into private possession. There were probably only a few thousand of these that survived the dumpster, if they even made that many to begin with. So it's not surprising that I couldn't find any bits and pieces online. And you know, these weren't critical parts, they were just options, and the rest of the machine worked fine, and it still does. But does it work fine for me? 
I mean, the 386 is not an amazing CPU. It's kind of neither here nor there. It's the very first processor that resembled the ones we use now. Uh, they're certainly more useful than a 286, but they're still very slow and ancient. So there isn't that much I could practically do with it. Um, to put too fine a point on it, even Doom won't run playably on here. To get into the other problems though, uh, we gotta look at all the hardware. So we're gonna play a game of what sucks about the 30 and then I'll show you the new hotness. Keeping in mind, of course, that I'm being hyperbolic. It's actually a really nice machine. Uh, I like a lot of things about it. It's just not as nice as the new one. So here it is, the 30. And we'll sort of be going all over it, but since I won't be opening up the CRT portion, I'll just tell you this part. Virtually every all-in-one I'm aware of puts the power supply for the PC inside the monitor half, since there's always some empty space in there, and it makes the machine a little more compact than it would be otherwise. So this power switch here turns on the PC and the monitor at once. Now here's a fun fact. IBM's primary consumer PC line in 93 was still the PS1 series, many of which put their power supplies inside the monitor as well, but those monitors were removable, so you could lose them, and then your PC would just turn into a pumpkin. Anyway. Now IBM made a lot of crappy computers around this time, but they always had an odd tendency to make their BIOS splashes look a little nicer than they had to. The EduQuest actually fades in its splash screen. That wasn't just the tube warming up. Let me show you. Okay, so the tube's hot and it fades in and then fades in the text separately. They didn't have to do that. It's a cute little touch. On the other hand, uh, since this is an IBM, it doesn't print all the diagnostic spew that we're used to. You remember how computers used to, before they went to EFI, print all that stuff on startup that would tell you, you know, the memory test and the hard drive detection and all that. Well, that was normal at this time. Uh, PCs in 1981 or 83 may not have printed anything on startup other than error messages, uh, but pretty much every clone made after the AT did. IBM, however, was committed to living in the past. So this one won't actually print any messages at all uh, other than checking system configuration, and then it'll give you an error message if anything goes wrong, if your keyboard is unplugged or the BIOS has errors or whatever. Uh, otherwise, it just plays this pleasant little boo-deep noise uh, and boots right into DOS. Though my favorite thing about it is, if something does go wrong, it plays a very sad beep boop there's a surprising number of things that can trigger this too. Uh, for instance, the machine remembers how much RAM it has. So if you add or remove any, it halts on the next startup and warns you about the change, which I guess might be good if your students like to steal things. Now after this, of course, it just boots up into DOS and it's a completely normal PC. Uh, nothing particularly remarkable about how it functions after the post, but there is one other interesting feature that you can trigger at post and that's DOS in ROM. The chips that store the system BIOS also contain a copy of DOS 5.0. That's what we have here. And the machine can boot from it, either as a primary option if you want, or a fallback if there's no other bootable medium. Now, the Tandy 1000, the Vendex Head Start, and probably a couple other clones did this, and IBM included it in some of the PS1 machines. So it wasn't unheard of, but it's still a pretty rare feature. I'm not sure exactly why they included it. I mean, the EduQuest was probably derived from the PS1, so maybe they just did whatever that division was doing. They definitely borrowed a couple other components like the floppy drive and bezel. Uh, so maybe that's all there is to it, but I'm not exactly sure why they did it in the PS1. I mean, those machines came out after hard drives have been universal and reliable for years. Now it did occur to me that uh, this could have some value in schools, since children are monsters who will destroy anything they touch. Uh, this could make reloading a trashed machine a bit quicker, since you could just boot into ROM-DOS, complete with CD-ROM support, and start rebuilding it, but I don't think that holds very much water. And certainly, uh, they had some more interesting ideas than that because there's an option to boot from ROM-DOS but use the config sys and autoexec.bat from whatever floppy disk is inserted or even from the hard drive. These are really strange options, so I have a hard time guessing what their intent here was. But besides that, there's just not much to say about how the machine works. After post, it's just like any normal PC. It boots up into DOS, and that's where the interesting ends. It's DOS. Now, when I got this, it was set up to launch a menu with links to a bunch of educational software, mostly about biology, and I had hoped to go through those and show them off, but they didn't end up being all that interesting, uh, or they required CDs I didn't have. So I just killed that menu, and there wasn't much else of note on the machine. So 
All that's left, and honestly most of what makes this machine interesting, is in the hardware. So starting on the front here, we have your three and a half inch floppy drive, uh, which is fortunately a 1.44 meg, which you can tell because it says it right on the button. That's an old IBM thing. They introduced those on the PS2 and they were so proud of it uh, that they stamped it into every single eject button. And I guess they were still doing it by 1993. It's also fortunate that this drive is working because uh, it can be irritating trying to swap these out when there's a custom faceplate involved. Floppy drives are nominally the same, but sometimes the slot lines up and sometimes the disc jams as it goes in. Not that these fully worked when I got them. Uh, the drives in both this and the newer EduQuest couldn't eject, uh, which is common in old floppy drives. Uh, I'll give you a fun fact. Grease is typically a mixture of oil and soap. Not exactly the kind you use to wash your hands, but similar in ways. Uh, and the soap is a thickener. Uh, it keeps the oil stuck to the working surfaces rather than just dripping off. But eventually that oil leaches out and it leaves behind just soap, which as you can imagine is extremely sticky. So often when you get drives of this age, you can put a disc in okay, but when you go to eject it, it'll pop up, but it won't pop out. And that's because the eject lever is basically glued in place. It might be able to move if you push on it, but the spring can't actuate it anymore. Uh, fortunately, however, with just a little bit of disassembly, in this case, just popping the spring off and slipping the lever out, followed by a few minutes of scraping the grease off and scrubbing the remainder with isopropyl, everything cleans up and moves again. I've never had this fail to date, and these drives now both work perfectly. The machine also has a CD-ROM of the old style, which takes caddies like this. Uh, since I finally have one of these that works, uh, let's enjoy a good eject together, shall we? Oh my God, it's not plugged in. I'm not a smart man. Oh, this drive's broken. I forgot. Yeah, this drive doesn't work at all. Now, the upper left looks suspiciously like one of those primeval hard drives that had external faceplates, uh, but it's actually just a panel blank with an activity light. The sticker fell off. Now, around on the back, uh, we've got the power input, of course, uh, and then, shockingly, what appears to be four expansion bays, which we'll get into in depth. Below those, we've got the keyboard, the mouse, serial, parallel ports, and that's it. Now this is where we see the first outright deficiency in this machine. There's no external video output, and that's not surprising. Uh, that Compaq all-in-one doesn't have one either. Probably a lot of AIOs don't. The EduQuest's video output is connected to the monitor with a special internal cable. Uh, there's no uh, standard VGA port in it anywhere, and that's a reasonable approach. Most people would never want to use an external display, and since providing that output would require either an active splitter or switching circuitry, it's not surprising that IBM didn't bother putting one on the bottom of the line model. But it's not very convenient for me. Uh, if I want to capture video from this machine, the only option I have is to point a camera at the extremely reflective screen. That sucks. Uh, so there you go, problem number one that's only a me problem. Most of my other complaints are inside, so we'll have to open it up. Now I told you that neither of these EduQuests actually suck, and uh, one thing I love about both of them is maintenance. Uh, there are a lot of ways to make a tiny PC miserable to work on. Uh, the Compaq, again, provides a great example. The motherboard pulls out the back of the machine, but it leaves the drives inside at the front. To get to those, you have to take out screws on the front of the machine and pull off the incredibly flimsy bezel, which requires a bunch of wiggling and fiddling back and forth until the crappy little plastic tabs pop loose. Each drive then lives on its own little sled that you have to unscrew and pull out. And when you put them back in, you have to tease the cables carefully into place behind them so they don't get shredded. Uh, the EduQuest, on the other hand, puts the whole system on this sled. Uh, so we just take out two screws, And then there's one more on the bottom near the front and all the guts slide out at once. The only thing you have to do is disconnect uh, the video and the power cables coming from the monitor half. So this guy here is the video cable that just pulls out and then you go a little bit further. There's a tab you have to release back here. Uh, and then this guy here is the power cable that just pulls out. There's supposed to be a guide here, but mine disintegrated, unfortunately. And now we have the entire 
machine just like that. This is my favorite PC form factor for maintenance. Not only does it all come out as a unit, but unlike virtually every tiny PC, going back to the shuttles in the 2000s, uh, you can actually get to everything. Um, the expansion bays are right up here. Uh, you've got the cable connectors there, the drive, um, the RAM, it's all just right there and you can rotate it on your workbench in whichever direction you need uh, to get the stuff. It's fantastic. The only thing uh, that's at all inconvenient are the hard drive and CD-ROM, uh, but even those are accessible uh, pretty readily through these access panels. So this guy here uh, is for the CD-ROM. There's the cables and then you can remove these four screws to take the optical drive out. And then to get to the hard drive, uh, we just spin out one screw here on the side. And there's the hard drive bay. Now I won't say there's no compromises in this design. Uh, for instance, the hard drive is IDE and the port is right above the drive bay. You can see the drive is in there. It lives on this little Mac style sled, which was probably a lot easier to get out when it was new. Uh, anyway, since the IDE port is right here, they use this custom cable. It's only like two inches long. Uh, and that means if you install a new drive uh, that doesn't have the IDE port in the exact same spot, there's like no flex to twist it to, to make it fit. Irritating, but I mean, IBM couldn't have known. And you know, there's a couple other minor irritations. Uh, for instance, if you want to re-jumper your CD-ROM, well, you can't really do it through this port here. So you gotta spin out the four mounting screws, pop the data, audio, and power cables loose, and slide the drive all the way out the front. And then you have to reverse all those steps uh, just to test it. Uh, and if you find out you didn't get it right, you gotta pull it all out, unplug everything, and do it all over again. And you know, in general, that's kind of how this machine goes. Every time you want to do anything, you have to pull the whole sled out, pop the video and power cables, make your changes, and then put it all back together. You can't run the machine if it's at all disassembled. So that's a step back from conventional PC maintainability, but people who are just using computers instead of experimenting on them like weird creeps would never notice it. And I'd still rather work on this than most systems up from that time, which had those awful U-shaped steel covers you had to struggle with to get on and off whenever you wanted to do anything inside. So anyway, now that we're in, here's the machine. Not that you can really make much out since they kind of folded a normal PC back in on itself. You know, we've got the uh, floppy drive cage obscuring part of the board, uh, the add-on boards obscure even more. Uh, it's just kind of a visual mess, but trust me, there's a motherboard under there. Uh, speaking of add-ons though, uh, yeah, pretty decent expandability here. Uh, the board has four RAM slots uh, and the riser offers four ISA expansion slots or at least You'd think so at first glance. Uh, this is where we run into our second problem. See, these two slots are 16-bit ISA, which was pretty much state-of-the-art uh, for the time. I mean, there was PCI, but that was only on 486s. For a 386, this was as good as it got, and PCI was still catching on. So this was still fairly hot in 1993. And having four of them is a pretty good allocation. I've seen bigger machines that had less. The problem is that you can't actually put four regular cards in here. I'll show you what I mean. So for instance, um, here's a completely ordinary 3Com Ethernet card and I can install it right here. Okay, no problem. That's normal ISA and it works just fine. I've tested it. Now below that, we have a SCSI card. Now that one I didn't add. That came with the machine uh, to provide CD-ROM support. This seems peculiar, you know, why use an add-in board for an accessory that's included with the machine, but we'll address that later. It also seems odd that they wouldn't just use the built-in IDE controller, but at this point in time, IDE optical drives were still relatively rare, uh, so the drive that shipped with this is SCSI. Uh, at any rate, though, this card is also ordinary ISA, and I could put it in any other computer, um, and I could replace both these cards with anything I want. But now, let's take a look at the other side. It's a um, little weird. Here we can see what looks like two more identical slots. Now the top one came populated with, uh, you can believe this, a network card. Doesn't look much like one, but uh, this is actually a token ring card. Uh, I don't know much about it, except that uh, that port uh, is for an adapter that's what lets you plug into the actual network. 
The bottom slot was empty when I got the machine, but it does have labels for a sound card stamped into the metal, which is bizarre. I mean, who would do that? Why would you do that? What if you wanted to put a different sound card in there or another kind of card entirely? It's a wild decision, but hey, who am I to argue? Let's put a sound card in it. Here's an ordinary 8-bit sound blaster. Let's go ahead and pop it in. Hmm. Things are not working. It just doesn't really fit for a whole bunch of reasons. For one, uh, there's this little metal tab at the end of the slot that won't let uh, the backplane bracket slide in all the way. See, the uh, blank that came with it has a little notch taken out of it, which is unique. Uh, but also, uh, the card doesn't quite line up vertically with the back panel. The back is lined up with the slot in the back plane, but the card is completely missing the connector. And if I move so that it hits the connector, it uh, doesn't line up with the back at all. So this just doesn't work at all. Okay, so what about the top slot? Uh, I don't need a token ring card. I'm never going to mess with that. So let's go ahead and take that out. Let's take the screw out, but it won't budge because there's a second screw around here on the back going straight in through the back plane. That's weird. And uh, when you go to take that out, you'll also notice that the back plane hole is about a quarter inch shorter than it should be. So needless to say, if we try and put our sound blaster in here, yeah, it, it doesn't even get close to seating. So this is a total non-starter. This is some spooky business. What exactly is going on here? Well, basically, um, it seems that IBM, just coming off their proprietary high from MCA, decided they just couldn't stand a machine that had only standards compliant slots, even if it didn't make any sense. So these look like ISA, but they're not quite. I can illustrate this uh, with uh, the network card here. Uh, if it was installed over here in the normal slot, all the components are facing up. And when I take it out and flip it over as if I was going to install it here, they're all facing down. But now let's take the IBM token ring card and install it over there. And look at that, all the components are facing up. What IBM has done here is they've made special boards for these slots that are upside down. Uh, that is to say, if we take two cards, the IBM and the ordinary ISA, in the same orientation with the slot pointing to the left, you can see that the bracket and the components stick out the bottom of this card, but the top of that one. And that means that if you try to install this card over here, it's going to misalign with the back plane by one card width. This is incredibly irritating, and I have no idea why they did it. Maybe they had a reason, or maybe they were just being pricks, but Effectively, it means that these might as well not be ISA slots at all. And the real misery is, I'm pretty certain, electrically, they would work just fine. I checked the pin out in a couple places, and I'm pretty satisfied that it would be safe to plug an ordinary card into these. Uh, if you stuck, say, an XT-IDE in there, a card that doesn't need a backplane bracket, I think it would work just fine. You just have no way to secure it. You could mutilate the case, of course, but please don't, don't do that. So this is the other big disappointment, or really, two of them. One, uh, the EduQuest, as designed, is supposed to have a network and a sound card. That's what these two ports are for. You can't even swap them because they're keyed differently. The top port only accepts IBM proprietary network cards, and the bottom one only takes IBM proprietary sound cards, because this machine was supposed to have one of each of those. But I can't get them because nobody has spare parts. I don't have any use for the token ring card, but nobody's selling the ethernet card. And well, I did find the sound card on eBay for a cold 50 bucks, uh, but that won't solve the problem by itself because there's even more parts to that that nobody else has. We'll get to those later. But besides that, uh, even if I wasn't trying to make this thing, you know, museum grade and like new, uh, if I was okay with putting inauthentic third party cards in there, this damn SCSI controller is taking up one of the only two normal slots in the machine. So I could put in a sound card or an ethernet card, but I couldn't put in both. What a boneheaded decision. But it is, to be fair, one of the few things that they screwed up. 
Like I said, the Edge Quest 30 is a remarkably nice machine for an all-in-one. It's pretty, it's nice to work on, the CPU doesn't predate subphylum vertebrata, and honestly, it would work great for a lot of people. If you find one, you should get one. You'll like it. The things that bug me about it mostly just bug me. But none of those complaints are actually why this sat around and did nothing for a year and a half instead of appearing in another video. That was for a much sillier reason, which is that I couldn't get the CD-ROM to work. Well, I'll never get this one to work. This was actually in the 40 and it's actually completely dead. Uh, but this came with a different one and I couldn't get it to function. I mean, it's not surprising a drive this old would be broken. It's been around for over 30 years. Uh, when I got it, I put a disc in and it just spit it right back out at me. And I thought, well, that's fair. I'd be done too. But I tried switching it for another drive and it didn't work. The SCSI controller wouldn't recognize that new drive at all. Now, my memory fails me, as it often does, but uh, for some reason, I remember that I got it in my head that I needed to access the CMOS setup in the machine to diagnose this, and that's when I found out that it had a password. I know, right? What luck? It's astonishing that the battery on this thing was still good after all these years, but it was, and it still had a password, and I could not find a way to reset it. There's no jumper on the board. There's no battery to pull out. You can look as hard as you want. There's nothing there. I was understandably puzzled by this for a bit until my eyes landed on this little monolith, which many retro computing fans will recognize. It's a Dallas DS1287, Dallas, or compatible anyway, uh, which was a once popular real-time clock. Now's a great time for a little PC history lesson. The original IBM PC didn't keep track of time when it was turned off. Whenever you powered it up, you had to type in the current date and time. It would keep track of it as long as it was on, but as soon as it lost power, it would forget again because it didn't have a real-time clock or RTC, which is literally just an electronic clock with a battery that lives on your motherboard. As late as 1983, if you wanted an RTC, you had to buy an add-on board from a third party and stick it in an ISA slot. But then in 84, IBM finally added one to the PCAT. And there's been one in every computer designed since then, even the one you're on right now. The RTC was long ago absorbed into the chipset, but there is still a distinct clock module in your computer's design. Now, since these have to run off of battery when the PC is off, they need to pull as little power as possible. The tiny coin cell on virtually all motherboards only stores about 230 milliamp hours, and your RTC is expected to run for years. So the original ones used a semiconductor technology with the lowest power draw, uh, which was CMOS. Now that's actually extremely commonplace technology and was almost meaningless even at the time, but it got used in marketing and it wound its way into the computer lexicon anyway. All right, I just got that part about CMOS wrong, but that's okay because it means I get to read you the funniest quote in the history of electrical engineering. It's from the oral history of the Intel 386 as recorded by the Computer History Museum in Mountain View. And it's an absolutely incredible document uh, that tells the story of how the 386 almost never existed because Intel considered the 286 an abject failure. Uh, you really should take the time to read it yourself. It's a blast. But at one point, they talk about the silicon process that Intel used. Uh, see, I thought that CMOS was commonplace in the 80s, but apparently that was only in the back half of the decade. Uh, prior to that, virtually everything used the NMOS process, including the 286 CPU. The 386 was Intel's first CMOS chip, and so we get this conversation. Uh, the interviewer, Jarrett, asks, what led Intel to go from NMOS to CMOS? Uh, one of the engineers, Prack, replies, well, Intel was really late. There was an overall trend towards CMOS, and I think people realized it reduced power consumption. Uh, and the other benefit was it provided cleaner logic levels. The zeros were really zero, and the ones were ones, and NMOS didn't do that. They had the zeros, but they didn't have the one. The one wasn't very good. And his buddy, uh, Slager, pipes up, it was only about 0.8. But what does the clock have to do with the password? Well, uh, the password is in what we call the CMOS setup. Notice the uh, synchronicity here? 
Machines made before the PCAT didn't have a CMOS setup because they had no non-volatile memory on board. The only settings you could change were made through physical jumpers on the board. But when the RTC was added to the AT design, suddenly the PC had a little tiny bit of storage on board. The internal memory in these clock modules had more room than was needed for just storing the time. There were a few spare bytes which the PC could use as general purpose storage. So to be clear, what I'm telling you is that PCs stored their configuration, their hard drive assignments, AGP speed settings, and overclocking config inside the clock. And I mean, that's not as absurd as it sounds. It's not like putting them on the graphics card or something. The clock was an intrinsic part of the motherboard. It was as permanent as anything else, unless it was this style, which sits in a socket. You can just pull it out. The CMOS password is inside this little black Lego brick and I don't know how to get rid of it. You'd think just unplugging it would do the job, right? It's lost power, so the settings should be wiped. But it's not that simple. There really isn't a battery anywhere on this motherboard because this style of Dallas. clock integrates its own battery cast right into the epoxy. You can't remove it. This situation is just goofy. Not only has this battery lasted far longer than it has any right to, but there's no way to disconnect it. There's no reset pin, you can't short it out, and you can't remove it or replace it. It's all one part. I mean, to be clear, it's running right now in my hand. If I had a logic analyzer, I could hook it up to these legs and read the time out of it. And the password, if I knew how, they aren't encrypted or anything. Lots of people know how to wipe them, but I don't. So I got clever. I thought, what if I unplug the clock, power the machine up, and then jump into the CMOS setup? It'll try to read the memory, but it won't get anything. So it'll assume it's corrupted and load the defaults with no password. Then I just plug the clock module back in, hit save, and I've unlocked the machine. This was a great idea, except that apparently the RTC serves some critical function on this machine and it won't even post without it. So I was completely out of luck, except not at all. I was just being lazy. The actual solution was to just order a new blank clock chip and replace it, which is what I did. They're readily available. Uh, in fact, the one I have in here now is a modded version of a different model that's meant to go into a device that does have its own battery, uh, but it's pin compatible with the one that was in here. So a kind person is selling them on eBay uh, with this mod, this little PCB that adds a coin cell holder on top. So you can pop it into a machine uh, that's designed for one of the fully integrated modules, but you still get the removable battery. You can pop it out to replace it if it goes bad or if you want to erase the contents. And sure enough, I popped it in here. It worked perfectly. And I got into the CMOS setup, no password, and I had no idea why I was trying to do that. I cannot figure out what I thought that would get me, um, but I decided to just uh, take another run at figuring out what was going on with the CD-ROM. With a fresh mind, I asked around and learned that SCSI drivers in this era were often locked to a list of specific drives they'd worked with. Anything else they pretend isn't there, which explained my problems. So in a whim, I put the original drive back in, not this one, the one that actually came in this machine, and I found that it worked perfectly. I just only tried a CDRW. If I put a CD-ROM or a CDR in here, both of them read no problem. I'm not surprised a 30-year-old drive won't read CDRWs. I just didn't expect it to get spit out at me, so I assumed it was a mechanical failure. I lost a year to that assumption. Uh, take what you will from that. So after 16 months or whatever sitting on a shelf, I finally had a way to get data onto the machine and just not much reason to. I sort of back at square one. So I was feeling like a total clown at this point and then eBay sent me an email that made me feel worse. Another EduQuest had finally shown up at a reasonable price or well, somewhat reasonable. I mean, I knew I shouldn't spend that much on it, especially since it probably wouldn't make it here intact. You really shouldn't ship CRTs. They have about a 50% chance of getting pulverized in transit. I've had a bunch of friends lose precious devices this way, and I always tell people not to do it, no matter how much you want the thing or how rare it is. It's just not worth it. So anyway, I went ahead and did it, since this is the only charmed part of my life. And it arrived perfectly intact, just like every CRT I buy. I don't know why this keeps happening. There's no good reason I should be this lucky. So yeah, I never expected to even find a PS2 Model 25 worth buying, but somehow I've ended up with two whole EduQuests. And that makes me one of the few people who can put these side by side and show you the differences. And there are some intriguing ones. So welcome to Beginning the EduQuest, Chapter 2, Part 3, 
you can begin again. The 30, the 40. They look pretty damn similar. In fact, as far as I know, the chassis are identical. I could probably swap the boards with no trouble, although I suspect the CRTs are not compatible. They are different tubes. This one is a lot glossier than that one. Trust me, that's made filming really annoying. There is a very similar quirk between the two though. It's a really strange one. The brightness knob on the uh, CRT here spins forever. When you get uh, to the end of it, it just goes from maximum brightness to minimum and back. And uh, I thought it was damage on this one, uh, but they actually both do it. I can't imagine it was intentional, but they seem to have the same design defect. Never seen anything like it. Besides the case, however, this is in every way a better machine. It fixes every complaint I had about the 30 while retaining all the things I like about it. But let's be frank here. I didn't know that at the time. I don't think I even looked up the specs when I made up my mind. I bought this not because it was a superior system, but mostly because it had a few extra parts that I was missing. My 30 was incomplete. The 40 isn't. It's all here. You'll notice that it has the IBM Ethernet card and the IBM sound card for the special ISA slots, which I couldn't find in 16 months of eBay searches. But more importantly, it has the front audio panel. Total unobtainium, but in my opinion, a critical part of the whole ensemble. Consider the following. This is a school computer. And in 1993, educational software was very much the CD-ROM multimedia type. Uh, that is the first year that Microsoft Encarta was sold, to give you an idea. Now, CD-ROM encyclopedias, textbooks, interactive anatomy explorers, and whatnot were all over the place. Uh, they were packed chock full of video and sound clips, so a sound card was an essential component of a school computer. But you wouldn't want a dozen machines in a computer lab with speakers hooked up all howling about the mitochondria, so headphones would have been mandatory. And of course, you could plug headphones into any sound card, but let's think about the minutiae here. What was it like using headphones at a school at this time? Well, um, they would need to be unplugged and plugged in constantly, like uh, when a kid blows snot into a pair so they have to be replaced. Or if there aren't enough to go around, you'd have to keep loaning them from kid to kid. Getting behind the PC over and over every time to plug and unplug would suck, so putting a jack on the front saves a lot of hassle. But also, we know exactly which headphones they would have been using. Schools had the same headphones for like half a century. They used them for slideshows, audiobooks, hearing tests, the works. Everyone over 30 remembers these, and I wouldn't be surprised if even some Zoomers have seen a pair of school cans. They were dour and institutional. I think Caliphone was probably the most popular brand. They looked something like this. I almost bought a pair for this video since they're incredibly cheap on eBay and very on brand, but man, I didn't want to because I knew they were gonna be terrible. I almost talked myself into buying the clear blue ones since the 90s aesthetic would make up for a lot. But before I could do that, I came across a post on Usenet from somebody saying that they had a pair of the original IBM Telex headphones for the EduQuest, and that piqued my interest. I went and looked them up and I knew I'd found the right ones. They're perfect. So I got two pair of those just to complete the look. Although now I'm pretty sure they aren't the look. See, these headphones are mono, but the EduQuest sound card and headphone jacks are stereo, so you really can't use these. I mean, you can, but a mono plug will short the two channels together, which sounds extremely bad and might even burn out the amplifier. I did try it, but it was so crappy that I, I didn't even really get an impression of what the headphones sounded like. So I'm certain these aren't the right ones. Now I don't know what to do with them. In fact, when I went back and looked at the Caliphones, uh, most of them seem to be mono as well. So uh, maybe I'm wrong here. Maybe IBM didn't intend for you to use just whatever you had laying around. Of course, since I have them, I might as well review them. They aren't as bad as they could be. They're over ears, and I hate on-ear headphones, so I'm all about that. And if you were a kid with an unusually big head, they wouldn't have been painful or embarrassing because they actually fit surprisingly well on my enormous foreign adult head, even if I do look very silly wearing them. I have nothing with a mono output, so I can't actually test them. Review complete. 
Anyway, regardless of what headphones you were expected to use, they almost certainly had a quarter inch plug. That's just what you'd find in institutional use back then. But the only sound card I've ever seen with a quarter inch jack was the original Adlib in 1987. Pretty much everything after that used eighth inch, including the second version of the Adlib. So you could use adapters, but that's a bunch of extra parts to buy and more things to fail. So this is a pragmatic decision. Another one is that there's two jacks and they output the exact same thing so you can plug in two pairs of headphones. Presumably a lot of schools couldn't provide one computer per student or at least they couldn't get that many copies of their software. So putting two kids on one machine would be a necessity. Since no sound card ever had dual headphone outputs, this provides a built-in splitter. There's also a mic input, and that one is eighth inch, because while schools may have had headphones laying around, they probably didn't have any mics other than the ones in the auditorium, which would have used XLR plugs. So they'd have to have gone out and bought cheap PC mics, which were all eighth inch by this point. Uh, the panel also has a volume control, and that's a huge feature. At this time, um, most software had no built-in volume control and a lot of it ran under DOS, so you couldn't use the Windows mixer. I don't think there were any sound cards yet that had a software mixer you could control with a utility, uh, but even if they did, you couldn't do that in the middle of running a program. So software from this era just assumed that you had a pair of speakers with a volume knob on it, which is pretty much what this is. In fact, the speaker in the EduQuest, uh, very unusually, isn't just for beeps. It's hooked up to the sound card, so you don't need to use headphones uh, or a pair of external speakers. And it shuts off when you plug in headphones and the volume knob works for those as well. So this is a complete audio solution. And you can see now why I felt that the 30 was incomplete. A school lab computer in the 90s was meant to play in Carta videos. It was meant to have two kids huddled around it on headphones. That's a huge part of this machine's identity. Without the sound card and the front panel, it just wouldn't be finished. With its readily accessible quarter inch jacks and volume control, this panel adapts the machine to its expected environment. And that's why I almost went for the eBay listing just to get this. Now the sound card itself, we'll talk about later, cause it's a laugh riot, but let's finish talking about the good things first. There's nothing else new on the front, so let's flip it turn ways, uh, cause there's a bunch of new stuff on the back. Let's pick somewhere to start. Um, the ethernet card, far more useful than token ring to me. Ethernet in this era wasn't very convenient, and this card is a proprietary IBM option that can never work in Windows 95 apparently, but it's still a genuine GM part for a genuine GM car. Uh, below that, there's the sound card, uh, which still has the usual eighth inch jacks on it, but they're in this very weird up and down configuration. Never seen that on any add-in card, but who am I to judge? So both of the proprietary slots are populated and with the right things. This is exciting, but there's more cool stuff we can see back here. For instance, a VGA port. Look at that. This model does have video out, and it's the best kind. You don't have to pick between internal or external displays or configure anything in software. This just mirrors exactly what the built-in monitor is receiving, a perfect setup for video capture. So that rocks. Also, while the 30 has serial and parallel ports, this one has a second serial port, which I may not ever use, but it is a conversation starter. See, IBM used this eight pin mini DIN plug, which is Super unusual for a PC. You would find it on Macs of the same era, and I don't know if it's pinned out the same way or if Mac compatibility was the intent, uh, but it could have been. In 93, there were probably a fair number of Macs floating around schools and being able to reuse peripherals might have been valuable. But I think it was just a necessity because the gigantic 25 pin connector they used for serial port one just doesn't leave any space. For most of modern PC history, serial ports used a nine pin DE9 connector one of these. And a pair of those was a very common sight on motherboards until the 2000s. It's still generally recognized as the default serial port. And I thought it had been like that since the first IBM PC. I knew that DB25 used to be common for serial ports back in like the 70s, uh, but I thought it was a relic uh, by the 80s, at least in the world of PCs. I only recalled seeing it on peripherals, like modems, cameras, scanners, or on dedicated serial terminals. Uh, I didn't remember ever seeing it on a PC, but it turns out I just wasn't paying attention. 
DB25 was the standard serial port throughout the 80s everywhere, including the original IBM PC. The DE9 was first used, as far as I can tell, only on the combo serial parallel card that IBM sold for the PCAT in 84, and they only used it because they needed to fit two otherwise enormous ports onto one card. They couldn't shrink the parallel port down because it needs nearly all 25 pins, but serial can work with only nine, so there you go. I don't think DE9 existed as a standard serial port before then, except for the version Atari was using a couple years earlier, which doesn't seem to have been compatible. Apparently, it took a really long time after IBM introduced it to become universal, even in the world of PCs, however. As late as the 90s, it was apparently still not unusual to see full-size DB25, at least on IBM machines. So with uh, port one taking up all this space, there's just no room back here. They could have used DE9 for both ports, of course, but since most cables at that time were probably 25 pin on both ends, that was counterproductive, especially since most folks never would have used the second serial port at all. So we end up with this very strange juxtaposition of an extremely old standard and one that didn't even really exist in the PC world because it was almost an Apple proprietary option. So that's all the outside stuff. Uh, let's go ahead and get inside. This machine opens up the exact same way as the 30. You gotta pop the same two cables. There's the video. And then here's the power, which uh, has to slide out of this little cable retainer here. I really hate this cable retainer. It is super fiddly. There we go. I actually don't bother using this thing. I just had it in there for your benefit. But. There is the EduQuest 40. Now with this out, we can actually do something pretty cool. We can get rid of this chassis and look at these two machines side by side. And here we go, 30 over here, 40 over there, stuck in the middle with you. At first they look similar, but uh, once you start looking closer, it becomes clear they're nothing alike. Let's make some room so you can actually see the motherboard. The boards are, of course, from completely different generations. So, you know, the chip layout isn't similar in any way. Uh, but beyond that, there's one major design change in the 40. It has not one, but two SCSI ports built right into it instead of on a discrete card like the 30. This seems to make a lot more sense. I mean, they shipped the machine with a CD-ROM, so why use up an entire expansion slot just for a necessary component? I mentioned this was odd earlier, or we're coming back to it now. The answer is it was almost certainly not necessary. I would be shocked if you couldn't order these without a CD-ROM. They weren't assumptions in 1993. But more importantly, um, while I can't find that much info about how these machines were used, what I can find makes it clear that they were expected to be networked pretty much universally. And even in 1993, it wasn't uncommon for funded schools to have network servers with multiple CD-ROM drives so you could share programs among multiple users. Making the uh, SCSI card modular meant that at the very low end of the market, they could sell a machine that not only had no CD-ROM, but didn't have the dead weight of an expensive, useless controller chip in it, uh, both for cash-strapped customers and networked classrooms that had no use for local optical drives. I'm guessing at all this anyway. I don't know which options were actually available or how much these machines cost. I can't find a brochure or anything. And for all we know, there was no sticker price at all. If they were intended for education, then well, anyone who's worked in an office knows there's no fixed price for business to business sales. Everything is negotiable. The price is whatever the sales rep thinks will get them a commission. And let's be real, the EduQuest is the kind of product that IBM probably donated in great quantities in an attempt to drum up interest. Often, that sort of thing never turns into any actual cash sales. So for all we know, nobody ever bought a single one of these machines. But for what it's worth, when they first announced the EduQuest PC, Electronic Games Magazine, whatever that was, said that the 486 version, which included a sound card and modem, would be $2,000, which is about $4,200 in today's money. So if they had hoped for anyone to actually buy these at sticker price, there would need to be a lower spec model than this one. 
So a machine without SCSI made sense just as much as the built-in SCSI on the 40 makes sense. I think it goes without saying that at the top end of the market, the people buying the high-end version would want the CD-ROM without a doubt. Uh, building this in freed up an extra ISA slot. In addition, those users were probably more likely to have additional use cases for SCSI. Uh, you could probably run a cable from the second SCSI port around through the drive cage if you wanted to install a bigger or higher performance SCSI hard drive. Uh, or you could get an adapter bracket that would uh, convert this board level port into an external port so you could plug in an external scanner or a CD-ROM burner or something like that. Moving on, another difference between the two machines is in the video hardware. It's all built into the motherboard, of course, but the 30 has a chip I can't clearly identify that just says ATI 28600 on it. Uh, some online info suggests that's a VGA Wonder, a pretty old chip that apparently can only do 640 by 480. It will do it at 256 colors though, which is better than plain VGA. It could only do 16 colors of that resolution. The 40, on the other hand, uses an ATI Mach 32, which I think uses the Visa local bus internally. That was sort of the AGP of the early 90s. That's a slightly newer chip, which is good, uh, but I'm not sure exactly what its capabilities were as shipped because my machine has actually been upgraded. This is the video RAM that came built into the machine, but this is an upgrade socket for doubling your video RAM, and it came populated when I got it. So that would increase your resolution and color depth options for sure, and as it sits right now, this can do 1024 by 768 at 256 colors, which was pretty dope in 93. Definitely beats the hell out of the poor 30. Uh, but I'm not sure what it could do without that upgrade. I don't want to pull the chip to find out because I'm afraid it won't work when I put it back in. See, there's two popular websites for info about the EduQuests. Uh, one is named Walsh Computer Technology, and the other is Ardent Tool of Capitalism. Uh, the latter says they've never seen any chip that worked in this VRAM socket, but mine does. It shows one meg of VRAM. So presumably the machine came with 512K and this doubled it. You can do the math if you want to figure out what resolutions that would have supported, but since I'm apparently quite lucky, um, I don't want to mess with success. If I pull this chip out to see what it can do and then put it back in, it might not recognize it again. Although I did email the maintainer of Ardent Tool about this, and my name is now on that website for all future EduQuest owners to see. Finally, I'm famous. But speaking of upgrades, uh, there's another that's far more visible and you may have noticed it already, the CPU. The 40 came with an Intel i486SX soldered to the motherboard. Uh, the SX was the lower cost version of the 486DX, but they're literally the exact same chip. This one just has its floating point math unit disabled. It's not clear to me whether that was just because the FPUs in these chips failed tests, so Intel disabled them and sold them at a lower price to increase yield, much like they do today, or if this was weird capitalist brainworm bullshit where both chips were perfectly intact and they just wanted to make one that was artificially cheaper. But at any rate, the SX is literally an incomplete 486, although it is better than the 386 in the 30. This chip is soldered to the board. You can't replace it. But fortunately, IBM provided this upgrade socket, which is kind of a peculiar phenomenon. This was originally meant for adding a 487 math coprocessor to give your SX a floating point unit. That had been a tradition in Intel chips going back to the original 8088. If you had an IBM PC, you could add an 8087 FPU to just enhance your math capabilities. But the 487 wasn't really just an FPU. It was an entire 486DX. And when you plugged it into that socket, it disabled the original CPU and replaced it entirely. This is a silly approach, and I'm not entirely sure why they did it this way instead of just making an add-on FPU. The end result, however, is that even with machines with soldered on chips like this, if they have a coprocessor socket, you can actually use that to install a completely different CPU. So what I have in here is a 46 overdrive, uh, which is basically a much later revision of the 486 with a built-in clock speed multiplier and an interface designed to work seamlessly in an original SX board with no overclocked bus or anything like that. They came in a few speeds, but uh, this one is the 75 megahertz version. I couldn't find any documentation on what was compatible with the EduQuest, so maybe it would support the full speed 100 megahertz upgrade, but this was what I could get at my local junk store, so that's what I went with. 
I'd love to show you some comparison benchmarks, but the reason I got it so cheap is that all the pins had been smashed over. I had to spend about 40 minutes with a pick and a razor blade bending them all back into place without breaking any. I was shocked when it actually posted. I didn't think it would work. Uh, so I hadn't run any benchmarks ahead of time. And if I take it out now, there's a really good chance that I'll snap a pin when I put it back in. It's staying in there forever. So we can only guess, uh, but it's probably a pretty good bump in performance since the stock chip was a 25 megahertz 46 with no FPU, and this is a 75 megahertz with FPU. Now I doubt it's a perfect one-to-one -one improvement. There are probably bottlenecks all over this thing, but per the numbers at least, this is a 3X overclock. So again, why is this machine more exciting to me than the 30? Well, 386 at 25 megahertz, no FPU, 486, three times the clock speed with an FPU. Ugh. Now there's one more upgrade while we're in here and it's another conversation starter. That would be the RAM. You'll notice there are RAM slots in both machines, uh, but one's populated with two sticks and the other with four. There's a very confusing reason for this, which I got blindsided by, and you might too if you work on anything from this era. Both these machines came with four megs of memory soldered to the motherboard. Whatever you put in the RAM slots stacks on top of that. And I'd read that the 40 could be upgraded all the way to 20 megs, but I didn't have any of the right RAM on hand. So I just pulled the two sticks that came in the 30 and moved them over. I was surprised to see no improvement. The machine still reported just four megs of RAM. I didn't know if I was getting an accurate reading though, so I left it in there and went about my business. Uh, but then I started having weird problems, particularly when I tried to install Windows 95, which basically sat for half an hour and then gave me a memory read error. I consulted some friends and I learned that I had committed a faux pas that I never would have figured out without help because the RAM format used in these is weird. It's called a 30 pin SIM and they used to be common as dirt, but I've learned that they were actually very strange. I'll keep this as short as I can, but there's a really wild history lesson here. The RAM chips that home computers used in the early 80s only output one bit of data for each memory address. When you asked them for a given location, they just responded with a single bit. But computers back then worked with a word size of eight bits, meaning they needed to receive one whole byte for each memory access. So one bit chips wouldn't work on their own. To fix this, they stacked eight chips side by side, wired them to the same address lines. So when the CPU asked for a given memory location, all eight chips would respond with one bit each, producing one full byte. That's how the Apple II, the ZX Spectrum, and the original PC worked. And that meant that if you wanted to upgrade your PC's RAM, you had to do it in quantities of eight chips at a time. Or, well, more than that, because the PC used parity, which is a sort of error correction, and that required one more chip. So, with four RAM banks at nine chips each, if you were maxing out your PC, you needed 36 separate chips. And if you had a memory error, you had to diagnose 36 chips. This was obviously absurd and it was quickly recognized as such. In 1982, Wang, a major name in computing at the time, developed the SIM, a 30 pin module that integrated multiple chips onto a single board. It was a great idea. It pretends to be a single eight bit wide RAM chip, but the way it was adopted was ridiculous. They went to all this trouble to make an 8-bit wide memory module, but they never deployed it in an 8-bit system. It would have been really convenient in, say, the original IBM PC, whose CPU only had an 8-bit wide bus, but that never happened. The earliest machine I'm aware of that used these was Wang's APC, sold in 1985 with a 286 processor that had a 16-bit bus. So we were right back to the same nonsense. Sims only produce eight bits. So you needed two side by side to get 16 bits out. You didn't have to stick handfuls of chips in the machine at least, but you could still only upgrade it two sticks at a time. So their solution was outpaced before it could even get adopted, but it did get adopted anyway, just very, very late. Everyone started putting these slots on their 286s, and then the 32-bit CPUs came out, the 386 and the 486, and we kept using 30-pin SIMs, except that now it took four sticks side by side to assemble a full memory bus, a absolute clown college design. Nonetheless, these were made and sold in great quantity. And you'd think we would have recognized that this format wasn't adequate. And we did. A couple years into it, the 72 pin SIM was invented, which was 32 bits wide. It completely solved this problem. And there were tons of motherboards that used it. 
but they also often included 30 pin sockets as well. So there were all these boards that spent almost 25% of their surface area on different kinds of RAM slots. This went on for years. I guess it was just in case you had a bunch of the old stuff laying around. Apparently it took at least a decade for this to finally resolve because while the Edge Quest 55, which came out in 1995, did take 72 pin SIMs, the 40 from 93 doesn't. So although I had put in two megs of RAM, it wasn't the right shape. I would have needed four separate sticks for that to work. But wait a minute then, why does the 30 work with only two sticks? The 3A6 is a 32 bit processor, shouldn't it need four as well? This confused the hell out of me until I learned more ancient shenanigans. The chip in the 30, uh, which you can't see, I think it's under the floppy drive here, uh, is a 386 SLC, which is an IBM adaptation of Intel's 386SX, which was in turn a cut rate version of the 386, which only had a 16 bit bus. So it's 32 bits internally, it just only reads or writes 16 bits at a time. This sounds like a performance disaster, and as you might have guessed, the narrow bus forces the chip to spend two clock cycles for every memory access, which is bad. But from what I understand, due to other bottlenecks in the 386 design, this didn't have that much impact. So the SX was actually not all that bad. And it has the side effect that these CPUs will work with only two SIMs. You can look on the bright side there if you want, I guess. So I went to eBay, I bought four sticks of four megs each, and I got this thing slammed all the way to 20 megs of RAM for like 30 bucks, which is kind of absurd because for that much, I think I probably could have bought like 16 gigs of DDR4. But anyway, there's the whirlwind tour of both machines. Uh, but before we put these back together, uh, let's take a moment and find out what the wonky jacks on the sound card are all about. Well, if we take a look at the card on the inside, you'll see that the two outer jacks use a sort of upright connector design, while the middle one uses a low profile connector, which puts the jack much closer to the board. So that's the literal explanation. It's two different jacks. I'm just not sure how or why this happened. The upright ones are line in and line out, and based on their contact pattern here on the bottom, they seem to be switching jacks, meaning that they have a signal routed through them when nothing's plugged in, and then when you connect something, it breaks the circuit and replaces that signal. Uh, these are the sort of things you use if you want speakers to cut off when headphones are plugged in, for instance. But I'm not sure what signal they'd be rerouting here. Uh, still, that is what makes the difference. The uh, mic jack is a non-switching type, and presumably those were a little cheaper, and IBM probably couldn't find them in the same form factor. So they designed the card around mismatched connectors, resulting in this visual discontinuity. This sort of thing isn't that unusual for board level components, you know, capacitors and stuff. Um, companies frequently make accommodations in case they can't get enough of something. Uh, you'll see, for instance, circuit boards that have two different hole patterns for the same component but it's very weird to see it in such a visible place. It almost seems unprofessional. But with that minor mystery solved, uh, you've now heard everything there is to say about the guts. But like I said, with it all back together, even the 40 is just a normal computer. I'm sure this machine came with DOS, but I put Windows 95 on it because I could. It functions. There's nothing to talk about. It is like every other computer with Windows 95 in history. I have it running at 1024 by 768 with 256 colors, the best this graphics chip can deliver. It's a bit flickery, uh, even to human eyes, but it works and the display is just big enough for this resolution to be barely readable. That is all there is to say about it. If you want to play games on here, well, unsurprisingly, pretty much every 2D game in DOS history will run on here perfectly and look fantastic on the built-in display. This is actually quite a nice monitor in my opinion. The machine has no turbo switch, so anything from the early PC era will be unplayably fast, but that's okay. You don't actually want to play any of it. And unfortunately, even with the CPU upgrade, it's still just not quite hot enough for the 3D era. Despite all the extra memory and megahertz I poured into this thing, uh, it will technically run Quake, but not really the way anyone wants to. It's usually below 10 FPS and just not a whole lot of fun. Duke Nukem 3D struggles pretty hard, especially in larger areas. Rise of the Triad even stutters, and Doom regularly sinks below 30 FPS. But at least if you're a Wolfenstein 3D fanatic, this machine will serve your purpose at a clean 70 frames per second. 
And again, these are pretty much universal qualities of any pre Pentium machine. It is working exactly as expected. So let's talk about what's still broken even on the 40. You'll have noticed I didn't include the distinctive Windows 95 startup sound, despite how aesthetic it would be, nor did any of those games have audio. And that's because I can't get the sound to work. Probably because the sound card sucks ass on a genuinely unprecedented level. It's just terrible. You don't understand. Listen, this card sucks so much that IBM got sued over it successfully. The EduQuest sound card is based on the IBM M-Wave, a blend of herbs and spices built around a DSP chip, which was supposed to be a brilliant wave of the future. Not just a next generation sound card, but a modem as well. The EduQuest card doesn't have the modem feature, but I have another M-Wave that does. I believe this is an M-Wave Dolphin, uh, the standalone version, and it has a modem jack. Look at that. This leverages the fact that a modem in the modern era is just a sound card with a special interface. And while it meant that there were some peculiar limitations around what things you could do simultaneously, on paper, it was supposedly quite a nice design. In practice, it uh, apparently did nothing right. Among other things, uh, the modem couldn't run any faster than 14.4 kilobits while playing audio, so dial-up gaming was a bust. It had no support for the new breed of digital game port joysticks. It had terrible MIDI support. It didn't work with a ton of software, had no DirectX support. Drivers had to be reinstalled constantly, and it caused tons of system freezes. IBM still shipped these inside a bunch of Aptiva PCs, and they were apparently so unusably bad that the owners got together and filed a class action suit. Uh, they didn't win, but nobody's ever won any lawsuit against any business in modern history. They did, however, get the closest equivalent. IBM settled for I don't know how much. It doesn't really matter. Uh, it is extremely funny, though. I mean, look at this website. Is this not the most dad is angry website you've ever seen? The M-Wave cards are bad by all measures, and apparently the one on the EduQuest is basically the same thing. So, despite all my excitement about finally getting this special EduQuest sound hardware, I have had almost no luck getting it working. This Dolphin seems to be completely screwed. I can't make it do anything. The software won't even detect it. Uh, the EduQuest card does a little better. Um, still not great, though. The best success I've had is with the diagnostic utility that uh, came with it that I found buried in a driver folder. It'll successfully record and playback WAV files, so I know the card is, you know, alive, uh, and it includes a MIDI player, which up until today uh, would just fill the screen with divide by zero errors. But while I was shooting this video, it inexplicably started working, so now I can play MIDI's on here. Great, I guess. But they don't sound amazing, and I can't get anything else to do this other than this diagnostic program. There are no Windows 95 drivers, unsurprisingly, and I've had no luck getting the Windows 3 drivers to work. I just can't get them to do literally anything at all. And uh, while it's supposed to have Sound Blaster emulation for DOS titles, that just doesn't work. Um, most games say they can't communicate with the sound card, others claim to be working, but they don't output any sound, and uh, several of them just hard freeze the whole machine as soon as I start it. It also emulates an ad lib card, and that does work. About half the games I've tried with it will output sound, but it is horrendously comically inaccurate. I'd hope to demo how bad this is with Doom's readily identifiable soundtrack, but while it seems to start up okay, uh, and it says it detects the ad lib card, I don't get any actual sound. Uh, so instead, um, here's a few others. Uh, this is a game called Major Striker, uh, which was a pretty good shmup uh, from Apogee with really fantastic music. So let's hear what that should sound like. <laughs> And here's what it sounds like on the M wave. <laughs> Yeah. 
yeah, yeah, it's, um, it's rough. I'm not really sure what I'm hearing. It sounds like maybe there aren't enough FM operators and it's like assigning things to the wrong channels or something. Uh, and the volume parameters aren't being honored correctly. It's bizarre. And it gets even worse if we listen to some of the level music. Uh, here's World One as it should be. And here it is on the M wave. You notice how the noise channel on this one is just completely hosed? It's, it's just totally unlistenable. Um, I also tried the DOS version of Chips Challenge, which uh, probably isn't as well known as the Windows one, uh, but this supports ad-lib music, and you can tell it too does not sound the way it should. <laughs> For comparison, here's how it ought to sound. The music is bad enough, but this game uses ad-lib sound effects, and when you start pushing blocks around, it produces these horrible screeching noises. I can't even imagine what happens in later levels. I also fired up uh, this game called Zeliad uh, that was a uh, like a Japanese action RPG that uh, Sierra imported, and the music there is, well, just give it a listen. I don't think I even need to play the comparison for you. It's just trashed. So this doesn't work at all. And on the one hand, um, I'll be fair, I don't have the original drivers that came with the machine. Um, they've all been lost to time. Uh, so I had to scrape them together from various sources. Maybe I have the wrong ones. Uh, on the other hand though, that doesn't make any sense. If I loaded the wrong drivers, then they should just, you know, not work like every other driver. Uh, but of course, this being an IBM product, you know, one other than the original PC, the only good thing they ever made, I wouldn't put this kind of stupid failure mode past them. And the drivers themselves are pretty clearly a total goddamn disaster. You might recall that most of the early sound blasters required maybe a couple files to operate, and the very first uh, sound blaster required none whatsoever. Uh, the M-Wave, however, installs hundreds of files in dozens of directories and stuffs multiple lines into config.sys, loading all sorts of TSRs. Uh, the drivers uh, for the Dolphin version inject at least a dozen lines in each file respectively and add a program that runs every single startup, interrupting the boot process to ask whether you want to optimize for gaming, music, or applications on this particular boot up. I have no ability to critically and uh, technically analyze this product, but I don't need to. It's obvious at a glance that it was designed by aliens who had been told what a sound card was, but had never actually seen one. It's a particular shame if you ask me, because while I've only found a couple recordings of an M-Wave playing MIDI music, um, they do sound horrifying. Here's Doom. Apparently that's what the wavetable sounds like, and I really wish I could reproduce this myself. So if anyone knows how to make this go uh, so I can either make use of it or make fun of it, please drop me a line. The network card unfortunately has its own raft of problems. Um, networking a machine this old doesn't serve much purpose beyond bulk file transfers, and there's other solutions for that, so it's not really a critical component, but it would be nice if it worked, particularly under Windows 95. 
Unfortunately, it doesn't. Uh, there are no official drivers, and uh, while Windows thinks it's an NE2000 compatible of some kind, it's unable to talk to it. This isn't shocking, of course, since this card predated 95 by almost two years. Frankly, this just isn't the right OS for the machine. OS2 Warp might be a better fit, and I'll probably give that a shot at some point, but I still wish I'd been able to make it all work under 95, because that's just where I'm most comfortable. Uh, the network card ought to work under Windows for Work Groups, but I can't seem to get the drivers to work. And besides that, I can't really even get as far as testing it, because for some reason, if I plug in a network cable and then power the machine up, it throws an error, uh, which IBM seems to have no description for in any of their docs. So I suspect the card is actually busted, and that's a bummer, um, but on the other hand, it is just an Ethernet card. It was never gonna be unique in the way that the uh, sound card was, so I guess I could tolerate putting the 3Com in there and using that. It just would have been nice if I could get all the proprietary IBM crap working. But that really is just about all there is to say about it. The nature of old PCs, like I said, is that they're all pretty much the same, which is why I own several interesting ones I've never done videos on. Uh, that Compact, for instance, there are intriguing things to talk about, but only about five minutes worth. And I've got other things like this IBM PC convertible, one of the most interesting PCs ever made, but almost entirely because of its shape. Yes, it looks very strange. And I could talk about that for about five minutes and I'd be out of things to say because it boots up into DOS, it says C and you type DER. Wait, no, it comes up, it says A and then you type DER. But then it's just like everything else. Honestly, it took months of having the EduQuest around and poking at it from time to time to come up with even this much to say about it. And now it's just another PC I own. Although you will be seeing it again, I promise this time because the EduQuest division made another product that, uh, well, you don't have to use it with an EduQuest PC, but I think they hoped you would, and I found the software for it on this machine when I got it. It's called the IBM Personal Science Laboratory, and it's a remarkable concept, um, far more interesting than the EduQuest PC, uh, but it will, unfortunately, have to wait for another time because it's, it's a bit much. For now, though, that's all I've got, and, you know, I always wish that PCs had been more distinct. I think we all do. It'd be nice if different models had had more unique hardware features or, you know, weird software, uh, like the funky GUI operating system that I found built into that Head Start Explorer I reviewed a while back. That sort of thing is neat, and uh, even the little graphical launcher that was built into IBM's PS1s uh, was pretty neat, but there's only so much room for that sort of thing, and the PC's value as a platform was always its consistency. So. It's not surprising uh, that this isn't too common. PCs are doomed to be boring. It's what made them valuable. But don't worry, people like me will keep trying to turn the tiniest distinctions into hour-long videos. And I hope you enjoyed this one. Um, if you did, maybe consider subscribing to my channel so I know you're into this sort of thing. And uh, remember to turn on notifications if you want to find out when I upload new videos. But if you really enjoyed this, then consider supporting me on Patreon like these people here are doing, and especially these people here. I depend on their support to do really dumb things, like buying a whole second computer that I already have just because it has a faceplate I want, uh, and also to do slightly less dumb things, like paying rent on my studio or buying cameras. I'm incredibly grateful to everyone who's making this possible. Thank you all so much, and everyone else, thanks for watching.